So I want to spend a little time in this video um, talking about the idea of subliterature. And I touched on this in our previous video about stages of reading maturity, and we're going to spend a little more time here with it. Uh, I started off with this quote. Cervantes said, there is no book so bad but has some good in it. But I would imagine that all of us, uh, you and me included, have, have, have had the experience with a student of, oh my gosh, that's really not a very good book. I wish you would read something different. Or I'm so tired of you reading those books. Why don't you try something different? But like he said, there's no book so bad but has some good in it. Remember, we get better at reading by reading. And we need to keep that in mind sometimes when our kids are engaged in independent reading, making self-selected choices for their reading, and we don't always like what it is they're choosing. So let's think about subliterature. I want you to consider literature, what your kids are reading as a ladder. And I borrow this term from Dr. Terry Lassane at Sam Houston State University. She wrote a book several years ago called Reading Ladders, and it's all about um, bridging kids from one book up to another, up to another. The lower rungs of these ladders are what have been called sub-literature. Um, this includes stuff like comic books, juvenile series books, um, sensational novels or magazines, sen sentimentalized romance books. So think things like Junie B. Jones, or um, for some of you who remember the Babysitter's Club, or R.L. Stein's Goosebumps books, or some of the manga series that are out there. Um, a lot of that fits here. I sometimes think of um, when I think of sentimentalized romance books, I think of the books that are written by Lurley McDaniel that are aimed right at teenage girls. Lots of sentimental romance in there. I also think about books that are aimed at adult readers by um, a romance author named Barbara Cartland. Um, I think of that um, as falling into this lower rung, this sub-literature. So how does this sub-literature compare to what we as adults read for pleasure. So we've talked about this a little bit before, um, but many of us, when we read for pleasure or when we choose our next beach read or our vacation read, we're reading probably what is the equivalent of sub-literature for adults. So, uh, and when I say sub-literature, I don't mean sub as in lesser quality, um, but it's a lower rung of the ladder. So I think of as an adult, um, when I read John Grisham books, or when I read books by Jody Picoult, um, I read that for pleasure. They're not hard reads. Um, it, that would probably classify as sub-literature. Um, one of the things uh, that appeals to readers about sub-literature is that it uses a formula. So think about some of these books that kids get sucked into reading. Captain Underpants, uh, in previous eras, Nancy Drew or the Hardy Boys. What we know is almost um, invariably at the end of elementary school or into junior high, middle school, children get sucked into sub-literature. They find it fascinating. And this is regardless of how good their guidance has been. So their English teachers or their parents may be mortified that they're reading this kind of thing, but they have gotten sucked into it. Um, Part of the reason they are is because these books use stock characters, stock situations. Um, the story changes a little bit with each iteration of the series. Um, the plots are manipulated slightly from book to book, but overall they're the same over and over and over. It's almost as if the author has an outline uh, and they're just plugging in details for each book. In fact, that is what many authors have done. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about it, but if you're familiar with the Nancy Drew books or the Hardy Boys books, those were published um, by a man named Edward Stratemeyer, and he ran what was known as the Stratemeyer Syndicate. So he um, hired writers to basically fill in his outlines. Um, so the authors that many of us are familiar with as being the writers of Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys aren't really um, the people who actually wrote them or who came up with the stories. That was Edward Stratemeyer. The same thing is true of um, 
the contemporary series by Aaron Hunter that's known as the Warrior series. You may be familiar with them as the books about all the different cats. Um, Aaron Hunter has a cadre of authors who write for her and they sign contracts and they are only allowed um, to fill out her outlines, not to change the storylines. Um, so that's, that's the formula that I'm talking about. So many times it is an outline that they follow. Let's think about why kids find it fascinating. Uh, for one, a lot of times this reading material is cheap. So think about comic books. They're inexpensive. They're easily accessible. Think about uh, some of the magazines that kids like to read. They don't cost a lot. You can find them at the grocery store or at, the, the, at Walgreens or CVS. Children, what we know is children will tend to read what is at hand. We talked about that earlier when we talked about the necessity of classroom libraries. The research shows that um, kids will read more when they have reading material in close proximity. Um, a lot of times these are patterned stories and they're very easy to read. Story pattern um, is what makes up all of folk literature. Um, it moves action to action without a lot of buildup, without a lot of motivation or inspiration. Um, the most important appeal is that with many of these books, there's a high degree of what we call wish fulfillment and escapism. So the main character's wish comes true. Um, uh, they have the chance to escape. Kids read, kids read these books and often adults are not present in the books. It is just about um, the kids. That's appealing to kids. When we think about subliterature and the positive aspects or benefits of it, typically through subliterature, kids first encounter a, story, encounter a story that's so exciting they forget their reading. That's that whole unconscious delight thing. These, uh, a lot of series books that kids get stuck in or get lost in is a better way to say it. Um, they tend to be subliterature. Subliterature embeds in us the literary conventions and patterns, but in a skeletal form. So when kids are reading subliterature, they're beginning to internalize story patterns and tropes and archetypes that they'll see later on in more complex literature. Um, and what we know is that this kind of reading material makes the whole unconscious delight stage of reading possible, which is what we want to happen with our kids. So if we think in terms of those reading ladders that I mentioned earlier that Terry Lassane wrote about, where can subliterature take your readers? What you want to do is think about what are some of the series books that my kids really enjoy? What's some of the subliterature that they really enjoy? And think about what are the characteristics of that subliterature? And what is another book that that student might like that has some of those same characteristics but is a little more complex? And then what could I build from then and then? So let's say if they like Goosebumps books, maybe they maybe part of what they like about Goosebumps is um, the paranormal in it. Maybe they really are attracted to some of those paranormal characters or plots. So maybe if they like Goosebumps, maybe you bump them up next. This is kind of a big jump, uh, but you could bump them up to maybe Stephanie Meyer's Twilight series or you could bump them um, to the series by Marlene Perez, that it's a mystery series, and it's set in um, a city where about half of the population has some kind of paranormal ability. And from there, you could move them up to Holly Black's um, The Coldest Girl in Cold Town, uh, which is um, another book with paranormal um, content to it. And from there, you could bump them up even maybe to Anne Rice's, uh, her vampire series. So that's what you want to think about is how can I build my kids up from this sub-literature to more complex texts, not how can I get them to stop reading this sub-literature. One of the things that sub-literature does sometimes is it gives the appearance of literary sophistication without demeaning the self-esteem of the teenage reader. And the way they do that is um, with 
kind of an inflated vocabulary. Sometimes it's called purple prose when the author throws in some vocabulary that's rather elevated for kind of the way the story has been written so far. The nice thing about it is it does this without demeaning the reader. When you have a kid who is here, who they're at this stage of reading, this sub-literature, you want to know that it's a stage or a phase. As a teacher and a parent, um, you really just don't even want them to buy one more single Captain Underpants books at the book fair, but know that they're going to, and that's okay. Instead, you want to feed them as many of the books as you can. Make sure that you have them accessible to the students. Um, and then also share with your kids that this sub-literature, it's part of what you read, but point out other things that you read as well. And I do literally mean point out the things that you read that are sub-literature and help them understand that as a reader, you do read sub-literature, but you also read other things. Uh, it's also okay when they're reading sub-literature to point out the stereotypes that are often evident in those books. Kids sometimes read right through those stereotypes. It's okay to point them out to kids and help them understand that they do show up. Let them read as many as they want. Remember, the more you read, the better you get. Just like Cervantes said, there's still something good in it. Um, know that as they read these books, because the patterns are familiar, it helps them build their automaticity and their fluency. So it's not a bad thing. Just be thinking about how you can build them up with those reading ladders.